Alamin lah, bah. Di ni ada so di ni ya, best normal aja. Di ni pada dah di lah hajar lebo. No, di ni tu ye asal ni tu dia nak tu ni tu anak orang dia awal, no. Batch long processes your data one mini batch at a time, but at test time you might need to process the examples one at a time. Let's see how you can adapt your network to do that. Recall that during training, here are the equations you use to implement batch long. Within a single mini batch, you sum over that mini batch of the zi values to compute the mean. Um, so here, you're just summing over the examples in one mini batch. I'm using m to denote the number of examples in the mini batch, not, not in the whole training set. Then you compute the variance, and then you compute z norm by scaling by the mean and standard deviation with epsilon added for numerical stability. And then z tilde is taking z norm and rescaling by gamma and beta. So notice that mu and sigma squared, which you need for this scaling calculation, are computed on the entire mini batch. But at test time, you might not have a mini batch of 64, 128, or 256 examples to process at the same time. So you need some different way of coming up with mu and sigma squared. And if you have just one example, taking the mean and variance of that one example doesn't make sense. So what's actually done in order to apply your neural network at test time is to come up with some separate estimate of mu and sigma squared. And in typical implementations of batch norm, what you do is estimate this using a exponentially weighted average, where the average is across the mini batches. So to be very concrete, here's what I mean. Let's pick some layer L, and let's say you're going through mini batches x1, x2, together with the corresponding values of y, and so on. So when training on x1, for that layer L, you get some mu L. And in fact, I'm going to write this as mu for the first mini batch and that layer. And then when you train on the second mini batch, for that layer and that mini batch, you end up with some second value of mu. And then for the third mini batch in this hidden layer, you end up with some third value for mu. So just as we saw how to use an exponentially weighted average to compute the mean of theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, when you are trying to compute an exponentially weighted average of the current temperature, you would do that to keep track of, sort of what's the latest average value of this mean vector you've seen. So that exponentially weighted average becomes your estimate for what the mean of the z's is for that hidden layer. And similarly, you use an exponentially weighted average to keep track of these values of sigma squared that you see on the first mini batch in that layer, sigma squared that you see on the second mini batch, and so on. So you keep a running average of the mu and the sigma squared that you're seeing for each layer as you train the neural network across different mini batches. Then finally, at test time, what you do is, in place of this equation, you would just compute z norm using whatever value you z you have and using your exponentially weighted average of the mu and sigma squared, whatever was the latest value you have to do the scaling here. And then you would um, compute z tilde on your one test example using that z norm that we just computed on the left and using the beta and gamma parameters that you, you have learned during your neural network training process. So the takeaway from this is that during training time, mu and sigma squared are computed on an entire mini batch of, you know, say 64, 128, or some number of examples. But at test time, you might need to process a single example at a time. So the way to do that is to estimate mu and sigma squared from your training set. And there are many ways to do that. Um, you could, in theory, run your whole training set through your final network to get mu and sigma squared. But in practice, what people usually do is implement an exponentially weighted average where you just keep track of the mu and sigma squared values you're seeing during training 
and use an exponentially weighted average, also sometimes called a running average, to just get a rough estimate of mu and sigma squared. And then you use those values of mu and sigma squared at test time to do the scaling you need of the hidden unit values z. In practice, this process is pretty robust to the exact way you use to estimate mu and sigma squared. So I wouldn't worry too much about exactly how you do this. And if you're using a deep learning framework, they'll usually have some default way to estimate the mu and sigma squared that should work reasonably well as well. But in practice, any you know, reasonable way to estimate of your hidden unit values should work fine at test. So that's it for the bash stone. And using it, I think you'll be able to train much deeper networks and get your learning out to run much more quickly. Before we wrap up for this week, I want to share with you some thoughts on deep learning frameworks as well. Let's start to talk about that in the next video. Oh, Bobby. ဆရာလေးရောက်လာပြီဆိုတော့ပေါ့เนาะဆရာအာကိုတော့မယ်ပေါ့เนาะအမင်တော့ဒီမှာအဲ့လက်စနာလေးလိုက်တာလေးစစ
ဟိုဘာဝန်းနဲ့ရှင်မရှိမှာဆိုတော့ခုရအိုက်နေထားကိုမကြိုက်ပြန်ဘူးလေဘာမှာဒီဥစာနည်းနည်းတွေတော့အ
hobi ada aku sabi pula ya. Pak nama, oh ya, okay hobi. Ada dua lima suruh saya pas normalisasi kita dua guru ada pasien ada pasien zero pas one pas so yang pas tadi tu visa sorry tadi tu exam ya one dua exam ya dua pas exam ya ada dua macam ni exam ya dah exam ya dah guru ada apa apa dia dua macam ni tu awak semua dapat dah ya work with moment dan ni ada alone pas dia amat pun ada alone pas ada ni alone pas orang aku tu so ada ni aku siapa lagi dah ya tu tu pas dah tu yang tu pas pas alai oh okay ada ku ada ku pas pas mana ada ada ku Best kata, tunggu tunggu nak best juga solusi ni. Main ni video ni, ada tunggu nak best bawa main mudi ya. All all orang main mudi kan? Tapi aku di di sini lah. Tadi tu, ada tadi tu ye main ni bawa main sih ni. Bawa solusi ni. Nen now now tak buat, esok macam tak kau solusi ni. Tadi tu best ber. So tadi tu ber tak buat, ayam ni buat esok ni ber bawa yang bawa no. No so main ni video ni yang bawa. Abi, ada apa sahaja lah ya. Hmm, ada di mana solusi yang aku hal aku beli ya. Saya aku pernah minta masa bidau, cuci kereta. Ada berumur ni, baru bidau cuci kereta pun. Let's make me the last one. Dua, dua alau ini mau bau sulap eh. Ada jangan mau lah, alau ini belum sayi dia mau lah tu. Tu macam tu. Pihak sekarang value mulu pihak dia. Tapi tu? Sekarang value mulu. Tapi pihak elok juga. Sekarang value. Kelai dia. Uh huh. Eh, itu di mana tu? Kau bida balas orang ni macam ni. Kau tu bida ga konstan tamu ini. Ada mana? Why kau tu amish plus mana? Bias ka konstan ni. So. Ayo cost time sih dia tu cost time ni aku derive itu share ni awal ni derive itu share apa dia zero macam ni awal. Biro langsung jalan aku tu awal yang kau tu amat sangat sih dia tu dua tu sih dia tu awal langsung jalan dia ambil dua tu pound terlalu ni. Ada jangan lo tu pita tu macam awal ni tu awal. Hmm cost time sih lo bukan asal dia aku. Hmm hmm tu awal pita dia cost time. Nah betul jual ni lembut itu mana bukan aku jual ni lembut itu. Tua tu lah tu nampak tu awal ni lembut itu bukan. Tapi ni mana mungkin tu lah. Oh babi cost time. Okay. Asal tak me? Aku mak aku bawa ni di lain bu, no? Ya, ya, jual lagi ya. Ada wesan ni yang tu pihak dulu ni dulu. Hehehehe. Abi? Tiha, pada all ship distribution di Korean ship sudah jangan ni sebelah jadi. Nada aku kita lagi Korean ship ni pada. Eh, ayam tu ga di di normalisasi yang banyak alu alu ni, mana pas normalisasi. Kerana ada juga cara aku mian wasi ya, buat macam macam ni. Dia ni masih dia tapi dong, beria ni u, u high beria, high beria tu u apa beria tu kan bawa range ni u minyak ni, sketch orang ni tu minyak tu aje. Jadi ya aja ka, ku beria ni sih tu asal dia, u mah tu tu dia harus jadi lah. Di bawah sana, bawah sana pun macam tu je. Jauh ni ada ni yang jauh ni, jauh Amerika. Ini jauh Amerika tu, ini jauh mana train hari mula ni tu, aku tu aje kala tu jauh tu asal ni. Tiada guru sekarang kau memahu. Tapi apabila mula nampak solusi, ada apa yang perlu dilakukan? Kau bina sesuatu yang baru. Tapi memang aku pernah nampak lagi sesuatu yang baru. Tapi 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 aku pernah nampak lagi sesuatu Okay, dah normalisasi macam mesti usul sih. Nasi dia mah perlu pun ni. Stabilisasi mula tu, normalisasi mula tu usul sih. Tu apa? Oh, sakit pun saya mesti faham ni. Ama, ile pun saya sih tuan ni ada baru baru alu pun ni. Tapi ni, aku tu lihat lagi, lihat lagi. Normalisasi lalu lagi tu, tu lihat lagi, lihat lagi macam sih dia kari zaman ni mah. Wine sangat ni lah pun ni. Ay, ay kacau lor. Oh, guru tu kacau pun ni. Dia mungkin beri ni yang pun ni dia hal ni dia. Aku wine pun saya pun tahu usul sih. Tu apa? Oh, bobi oh, oh, kalau kau mah, oh, bobi oh, jenis cawan lah, mana? Jangan ubah fikiran macam tu, apa? Alu tu apa? Jangan ni apa yang salah pun macam tu, dia liar ni liar ni macam ni, kenal ni ya. Oh, jangan itu zapa ni hari tu apa? Rentak tu dia pun cuma kita itu, dia tu dia tu macam apa? Sentiasa, ajar orang apa? 
y normalizar ese pero lo lo que es para o se ha que pagar ahora era no te gusta tanto tú has hecho mucho no te gusta eh tú leyar ahí leyar ahí ale tú has hecho eso así leyar o me me coge tú no tú importa con el no usa bien pero no me la hizo va no va pero no me la hizo va a ver lo que es eso tú es que es tú si ves que tú a mí o a él lo que es ale tú puedes no me la hizo sin saber Ale luaran awak lalu ni ni tuai, aku apa sih di usah lepas, apa sih macam ni luaran mita ni awak ni, jadi luaran ni dia, tu sih luar impun ni ni usah ni normalisasi ni luar tuai, tu ni macam tuai, tuai, jom aku ni mula ni ni awak ni ni impun sih sih ni, tapi ni regularisasi ni apa sih dia jatuh sih ni tu ni, coba. Goi goi, ada sih nanya tu lupa. ตัวเจนาตัวนอร์มัลไลซ์ตัวเลยแหละตัวสักการ์ลีสักการ์เลเวอร์ของเจ้าลูกยาเลยเพราะเจ้าตัวพม่าเราเลยสุดประมาณเ
greatest data thi ko ro a yu ra me lo pyo da da so shin ko aku aku pyo lo sa o ne ne de thapo pa de so ko pyan chi le ya tu se ya pyo wa da ti ko ro ti wait a bit le sing le sing ya pye la bi nao so ya la de main le phase ya bi aku ro ti ba cha ma ko ro o test ka lo shin ko ya me so ni pyo da อ๋ออ่ะเดี๋ยวตัวรันนิ่งเอเวอเรจโกเวตรงเลยบ่เนาะแล้วดีเทรนนิ่งมาจ้ะเราอารมณ์มีนี่บ้างใช่ไหมเ
ဟုတ်ပြီဟိုဘာလဲအာဟိုဇီရိုပိုင်ဇီရိုဇီရိုဇီရိုဆိုပြီးတော့လေအဲ့လိုမျိုးဘတ်ရှ်တွေခွဲ
Hai gong tua kai ha ma ni. Ha ha. Ta er ba wa mini ba lesu kwa la bi do. Hmm. Now so kai ha ma a ta mo take reactors da da lo shin a di mini ne video yu to mi yo twa cha lai ma. Ha. Sia la pyo wa le to rani rani every so mi yo. นี่บ้านเสร็จแล้วมาดิมินิอ่ะบ่เลยอืมเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวมาเดี๋ยวนี่มาอีกมีเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวมาเดี๋ยวน
given x. This will output the probability that this dog is given x. That will output the probability. I'm just going to abbreviate uh, baby cake to be bc. So the probability of a baby cake abbreviated to bc given the input x. So here, the output label is y hat. It's going to be a four by one dimensional vector because it now has to output four numbers giving you these four probabilities. And because probabilities should sum to one, the four numbers in the output y hat, they should sum to one. The standard model for getting a neural network to do this uses what's called a softmax layer in the output layer in order to generate these outputs. Let me write down the map and we'll come back and get some intuition about what the softmax layer is doing. So in the final layer of the neural network, you are going to compute as usual the linear part of the layer. So Z capital L, that's the Z variable for the final layer. So remember, this is layer capital L. So as usual, you compute that as WL times the activation of the previous layer plus the biases for that final layer. Now, having computed Z, you now need to apply what's called the softmax activation function. So the activation function is a bit unusual for the softmax layer, but this is what it does. First, we're going to compute a temporary variable, which we're going to call T, which is e to the z l. So this is applied element-wise. So z l here, in our example, z l is going to be 4 by 1. It's a four-dimensional vector. So t itself, e to the z l, that's an element-wise exponentiation. t will also be a 4 by 1 dimensional vector. Then the output, a l, is going to be Basically, the vector t, but normalized to sum to 1. So a l is going to be e to the z l divided by sum from j equals 1 through 4, because we have four classes of t subscript i. So another way of saying this is that a l is also a 4 by 1 vector, and the i element of this four-dimensional vector, let's write that a l, such to i, this is going to be equal to ti over sum of ti. Okay. Um, in case this map isn't clear, we'll do an example in a minute that will make this clearer. Um, so in case this map isn't clear, let's go through a specific example that will make this clearer. Let's say that you computed zl, and zl is a four-dimensional vector. Um, let's say it's 5. 2, negative 1, 3. What we're going to do is use this element-wise exponentiation to compute this vector t. So t is going to be e to the 5, e to the 2, e to the negative 1, e to the 3. And if you plug that into the calculator, these are the values you get. e to the 5 is 148.4, e squared is about 7.4, e to the negative 1 is 4.4, and e cubed is 20.1. And so the way we go from the vector t to the vector al is to just normalize these entries to sum to 1. So if you sum up the elements of t, if you just add up those four numbers, you get 1, 7, 6, or 3. Um, so finally, al is just going to be this vector t as a vector divided by 1, 7, 6, or 3. So, for example, this first node here, this will output e to the 5 divided by 176.3, and that turns out to be a 0 0.842. So, saying that for this image, if this is the value of z you get, the chance of it being class 0 is 84.2%. And then the next node outputs e squared over 176.3. That turns out to be 0 0.042, so it's 4.2% chance. The next one is e to negative 1 over that, which is um, 0 0.002. And the final one is e cubed over that, which is uh, 0 0.114. So about an 11.4% chance that this is class number 3, which I guess is the maybe class. Right? So there's a chance of it being 
cos 0, cos 1, cos 2, cos 3. So the output of the neural network, AL, um, this is also y hat. This is a 4 by 1 vector where the elements of this 4 by 1 vector are going to be these four numbers that we just computed. So this algorithm takes the vector ZL and maps it to four probabilities that sum to one. And if we summarize what we just did to map from ZL to AL, this whole computation, computing the exponentiation to get this temporary variable T and then normalizing, we can summarize this into a softmax activation function and say AL equals the activation function G applied to the vector ZL. The unusual thing about this particular activation function is that this activation function G, it takes as input a 4 by 1 vector and it outputs a 4 by 1 vector. So previously, our activation functions used to take in a single real value input. So for example, the sigmoid and the value activation functions input a real number and output a real number. The unusual thing about the softmax activation function is because it needs to normalize across the different possible outputs, it needs to take in a vector of inputs and then outputs a vector. So what are the things that a softmax class R can represent? I'm going to show you some examples where you have inputs x1, x2, and these feed directly to a softmax layer that has three or four or more output nodes that then outputs y hat. So I'm going to show you a neural network with no hidden layer, and all it does is compute z1 equals w1 times the input x plus b, and then the output a1, or y hat, is just the softmax activation function applied to z1. So in this neural network with no hidden layer, it should give you a sense of the types of things a softmax function can represent. So here's one example with just raw inputs x1 and x2, a softmax layer with um, c equals 3 output causes can represent this type of decision boundary. Now this is kind of a several linear decision boundaries, but this allows it to separate out the data into three classes. And in this diagram, um, what we did was we actually took the training set that's kind of shown in this figure and trained the classifiers and trained the softmax classifier with three output labels on the data. And then the color on this plot shows fetch holding the outputs of the softmax classifier and coloring in the input based on which one of the three outputs had the highest probability. So we can maybe kind of see that this is like a generalization of logistic regression with sort of linear decision boundaries, but with more than two causes. Well, instead of the cost being just 0, 1, the cost can be 0, 1, or 2. Here's another example of decision boundary that a softmax classifier can represent when training on the data set with three classes. And here's another one, right? So this is, a, a, but one intuition is that the decision boundary between any two classes will, will be linear. That's why you see, for example, the decision boundary between the yellow and the red classes, that's sort of a linear boundary between purple and red is now a linear decision boundary between purple and yellow is another linear decision boundary. But you know, it's able to use these different linear functions in order to separate the space into three classes. Let's look at some examples with more classes. So this example with C equals 4, so that the green class and softmax can continue to represent these types of linear decision boundaries between multiple classes. So here's one more example with C equals 5 classes, and here's one last example with C equals 6. So this shows the type of things a softmax class I can do when there is no hidden layer. Of course, if a much deeper neural network, with x and then you know some hidden unions and more hidden unions and so on, then you could learn even more complex nonlinear decision boundaries to separate out multiple different classes. So I hope this gives you a sense of what a softmax layer, what a softmax activation function in a neural network can do. In the next video, let's take a look at how you can train a neural network that uses a softmax layer. Oh, Bobby, oh, Bobby. In the last video, you learned about the softmax layer, the softmax activation function. In this video, you deepen your understanding of softmax classification and also learn how to train a model that uses a softmax layer.
recall our earlier example where the open layer computes ZL as follows. So we have four classes, C equals four, then ZL is going to be four by one dimensional vector. And we said we compute T, which is this temporary variable that performs element-wise exponentiation. And then finally, if the function for the output layer, T of L, then the output will be this. It's basically taking that temporary variable T and normalizing it to sum to one. So this then becomes A of L. So you notice that in the Z vector, the biggest element was five, and the biggest probability ends up being this first probability. The name softmax comes from contrasting it to what's called a hard max, which would have taken the vector z and mapped it to this vector. So hard max function would look at the elements of z and just put a one in the position of the biggest element of z and then zeros everywhere else. And so this is a very hard max where the biggest element gets a output of one and everything else gives the output of zero. Whereas in contrast, the softmax is a more gentle mapping from z to these probabilities. So I'm not sure if this is a great name, but at least uh, that was the intuition behind why we call it a softmax. Um, it's in contrast to the hard max. And one thing I didn't really show, but had alluded to, is that softmax regression or the softmax activation function generalizes the logistic activation function to C causes rather than just two causes. And it turns out that if C is equal to two, then softmax with C equals to two essentially reduces to logistic regression. And I'm not gonna prove this in this video, but the rough outline for the proof is that if C equals to two and if you apply softmax, you know, then the output layer AL will output two numbers of C equals two. So maybe it outputs 0 0.842 and 0 0.158, right? And these two numbers always have to sum to one. And because these two numbers always have to sum to one, they're actually redundant. And maybe you don't need to bother to compute two of them. Maybe you just need to compute one of them. And it turns out that the way you end up computing that number reduces to uh, the way that logistic regression is computing is single output. So that wasn't much of a proof, but um, the takeaway from this is that softmax regression is a generalization of logistic regression to more than two classes. Now let's look at how you would actually train a neural network with a softmax output layer. So in particular, let's define the loss function you use to train a neural network. Let's take an example. Let's say you have an example in your training set where the output is, um, where the target output the ground truth label is 0, 1, 0, 0. So the example from the previous video, this means that this is an image of a cat because it falls into class one. And now let's say that your neural network is currently outputting y hat equals, so y hat would be a vector probability scale of sum to one, um, 0 0.1, 0 0.4. So you can check that sum to one, and this is going to be a L. So the neural network is not doing very well in this example because this is actually a cat and assigned only a 20% chance that this is a cat. So it didn't do very well in this example. So what's the last function you want to use to train this neural network? In softmax classification, the loss we typically use is negative sum of j equals one through four. And it's really sum from one to c in the general case. So I just use four here of y log of yj log y hat of j. So let's look at our single example above um, to better understand what happens. Notice that in this example, y1 equals y3 equals y4 equals zero, because those are zeros and only y2 is equal to one. So if you look at this summation, all the terms with zero values of yj will equal to zero. And the only term you're left with is negative y2 log y hat 2, because when you sum over the indices of j, all the terms will end up 0, except when j is equal to 2. And because y2 is equal to 1, this is just negative log y hat 2. So what this means is that if your learning algorithm is trying to make this small, because you use gradient descent to you know, try to reduce the loss on the training set, then the only way to make this small is to make this small, 
And the only way to do that is to make y hat 2 as big as possible. And uh, these are probabilities, so it can never be bigger than 1. But this kind of makes sense, because if x, for this example, is a picture of a cat, then you want that output probability to be as big as possible. So more generally, what this loss function does is it looks at whatever is the ground truth class in your training set, and it tries to make the corresponding probability of that class as high as possible. If you're familiar with maximum likelihood estimation in statistics, this turns out to be a form of maximum likelihood estimation. But if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. Um, the intuition we just talked about will suffice. Now, this is the loss on a single training example. How about the cost, J, on the entire training set? So the cost of the setting of the parameters, you know, and so on, of all the weights and biases, you define that as pretty much what you guess, sum of the entire training set of the loss, your learning algorithms, predictions, uh, summed over your training samples. And so what you do is use gradient descent in order to try to minimize this cost. Finally, one more implementational detail. Notice that because c is equal to 4, y is a 4 by 1 vector, and y hat is also a 4 by 1 vector. So if you're using a vectorized mutation, the matrix capital Y is going to be y1, y2, through ym, stacked horizontally. And so, for example, if this example up here is your first training example, then the first column of this matrix Y will be 0, 1, 0, 0. And then your second example, maybe the second example is a dot, maybe the third example is a none of the above, and so on. And then this matrix capital Y will end up being a 4 by n dimensional matrix. And similarly, Y hat will be Y hat 1 stacked up horizontally going through y hat m, so this is actually y hat 1, um, or the output on the first training example, then y hat will be this 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0.4, and so on, and y hat itself will also be a 4 by m dimensional matrix. Finally, let's take a look at how you implement gradient descent when you have a softmax output layer. So this output layer will compute zl, which is c by 1 in our example, 4 by 1, and then you apply the softmax activation function to get a l, or y hat, and then that in turn allows you to compute the loss. So we've talked about how to implement the forward propagation step of the neural network to get this output and to compute that loss. How about the back propagation step? Or gradient descent. Turns out that the key step of the key equation you need to initialize back off is this um, expression that the derivative with respect to z at the last layer. This turns out you can compute as y hat, the 4 by 1 vector, minus y, the 4 by 1 vector. So you notice that all of these are going to be 4 by 1 vectors when we have four classes, and c by 1 in a more general case. And so this, going by our usual definition of what is dz, this is a partial derivative of the cost function with respect to zl. Um, if you're an expert in calculus, you can derive this yourself. Uh, or if you're an expert in calculus, you can try to derive this yourself, but using this formula will also just work fine if you ever need to implement this from scratch. But with this, you can then compute dzl and then sort of start off the back prop process to compute all the derivatives you need throughout your neural network. But it turns out that in this week's programming exercise, we'll start to use one of the deep learning programming frameworks. And for those programming frameworks, usually it turns out you just need to focus on getting the forward prop right. And so long as you specify the programming framework, the forward prop pass, the programming framework will figure out how to do back prop, how to do the backward pass for you. So this expression, uh, is worth keeping in mind for if you ever need to implement softmax regression or softmax classification from scratch, although you won't actually need this in discrete problem exercise uh, because the program framework you use will take care of this derivative computation for you. So that's it for softmax classification. With it, you can now implement learning algorithms to categorize your inputs into not just one of two classes, but one of C different classes. Next, I want to show you some of the deep learning programming frameworks, which can make you much more efficient in terms of implementing deep learning algorithms. Let's go on to the next video to discuss that. Okay, bye.
ဒီမှာမဒီမှာဆိုတော့ထူးတော့မဟုတ်ပေါ့နော်ပုံမှန်ဆလဲဆိုတော့ဒီကြောင်ဟုတ်လာမဟုတ်လာပဲပုံမှ
ไม่ได้ไม่ได้กูอ่ะไอ้ที่นี่อูยก็ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่ไม่